with great love and respect in my heart, I welcome you from the city of Varanasi. It's pretty late here, it's 10.30 at night. But the city is still awake. It never sleeps. Before we begin, let's just take a moment to arrive. <clears throat> Wherever you are, just straighten your spine, open your shoulders, lighten your mind, and close your eyes. Relax your facial muscles, neck, shoulders, spine. Soften the belly and get grounded, grounded. Bring your attention to your breath. Breathing in, you are aware of the breath coming in. Breathing out, you are aware of the breath flowing out. As you continue to breathe, you become aware of all the restlessness settling down. Just for a moment, pause the breath wherever it is. Gently release it. Pause it again and bring your attention to the heartbeat. Release the breath again. And pause it again. Bring your attention to the center of the forehead. Thinking of your eyes being absolutely still. Your mind basking in the light of the third eye. And release the breath. Welcome a nice deep breath. and slowly open your eyes. Thank you for taking this time. I have another announcement, and that is I have extended my trip and will be staying in India till February 20th. Because February 18 is the foundation day of the Bal Ashram. 
haven't been here for almost two, three years since this COVID thing started. And my presence is needed here with so many projects going on and I'm not engaged in the projects, but I'm just sitting in the background and watching it all happen. Just my mere presence here is good enough. And I'm taking a little time for myself to visit the sacred spots, energy spots, holy shrines, and just to connect with another aspect of my own spiritual life. Speaking about visiting the energy spots, yesterday we went to Bindhachal Hills, Bindh Mountains. Bindhachal is an hour and a half away from the city of Varanasi. Been the mountain range is one of the most ancient mountain ranges in India. And as the story goes, at one time, Been the mountain decided to grow and it kept growing and growing and growing. It went on growing. It had grown so high that all the gods feared that it's going to hinder the sunlight from coming to the earth. They didn't know how to stop Bindha from growing. Finally, they went to the Guru of Bindhya Mountains. Everyone has a Guru. Everyone has a soul. So did Bindhya Mountain. The Guru came near the mountain that had grown so high, so tall. But when he saw the Guru coming, he prostrated to the Guru. The Guru said, stay in that position till I come back. Guru never returned. So the Bindha mountain is still laying down in prostration. That's the story. And as you look at the, the formation of rocks on the Bindha mountains, they're all sideways. And yesterday when I was there, I had read about this, heard about this, but I was very mindful of observing, are those rocks really sideways? And they are. And the spot that I went to yesterday was the spot where Sarkar Baba had spent many years in sadhana. He did his austere practices in, the, in that particular area. If you have read the book, Oasis of Stillness, there is a chapter in there. And in there, it talks about once Baba was summoned by another sadhu and he went, he followed the sadhu through a little opening in the hillside. And as he crawled around 50 feet, there was enough space for him standing and many other sadhus were doing their austerities, chanting Sanskrit mantras, doing fire ceremonies. And Baba was totally amazed to see this sight. 
as he described, he stood there for some time and he met that guide again and he took him to the another spot where a river was flowing under the mountain. And on top of the river was a giant lotus. Sitting on the lotus was Ma Saraswati, the goddess of wisdom, playing Bina. He couldn't believe his eyes and out of fear, he closed his eyes. <clears throat> and he, when he opened his eyes, he was back, sitting back under the tree where he was, where he had started. Anyway, that description was from Sarkar Baba, one of his recollections. And we have recorded that in the book. And when I was visiting that spot yesterday, that hillside is a mysterious place. Although on the surface, it looks normal, but the power, the energy of that hillside is amazing. Again, on the surface, it's normal, just like any other hillside. But if you are looking for the mystery and you are settled, in your heart to look for it, you feel it. <clears throat> there was a beautiful rock on which Baba used to sit and meditate. Now nobody sits on it. It's kind of marked. But I went there and I touched my forehead to that rock. And I could feel the tingling just coming through my whole body. Again, for many, it may not be the same experience. For me, it was that powerful experience, knowingly that my guru sat on that rock and meditated for hours. And he continued to do that for many years in a row. So when we hold that kind of thought in our heart and mind, we open ourselves to the mystery. Two people can see the same thing, but experience totally different things, depending on what we are holding in our heart and mind. Whatever is in our heart and mind, that's what we see. That's what we believe in. This was a very real live experience for me. That's why I'm sharing it with you. I didn't create it, but I just opened myself to the experience. Sitting in that spot where Baba used to walk around and he held many Navaratris. Just sitting there that Baba walked on these rocks. Rocks are like crystals. Crystals hold energy. And maybe it was my imagination that his energy is still there. But just even holding that thought in my mind, thought of sacredness, thought of at one time, my guru walked on these rocks and being touched by those rocks was a very special and sacred experience for me. Many people go there. There is a temple below there and they go to the temple, then they come back to that spot and they have picnics and they cook food and eat food. And they have a, one experience, but somebody goes there with this kind of sacredness, they have another experience. 
in order to get there, we had to go get up two in the morning, drive all the way hour and a half to be the first people in the temple when it opens and be, without the crowds. It was a very special day. We make anything special through our efforts. If I had not gotten up, we had not gotten up at two in the morning and taken a shower and jumped in the car and driven, all this preparation, putting ourselves through this hardship also prepared us to have that, to make it special and experience something different. If it was just for my convenience, oh, I'll, I can't do this. I have to sleep till nine in the morning and at my leisure, I will go to do this. Then it becomes just normal. If everything is done in life based on my convenience, we deprive ourselves of that specialness. So making little effort, going through little hardship is very important in, spirit, in spiritual life. I'm speaking to you because I'm very familiar with the thought process. We have created a pattern and we do not want to break that pattern for the fear of losing our convenience and our comfort zone. So staying in our comfort zone, we try to do our spiritual practice or try to gain some experience. It, it becomes very difficult. In order to have some deeper experience, we have to come out of our comfort zone. and not look at that as a torture or a punishment or total inconvenience. The excitement is there to go and visit something or experience something that overrides our need to be in our comfort zone. Without friction, there is no spark. There has to be a little friction. There has to be a little effort. Sometimes we hear something somebody says something to us we hear it then we make up our mind without thinking why that person is saying to me Why did they hear? What, why did they see whatever they saw? It's their experience. It's not your experience. If you haven't experienced that firsthand, just because somebody said it to you, it becomes your truth. We have to think about that. We have to enlarge our heart. If we are calling ourselves spiritual practitioners and spiritual being, there has to be space in our heart. I'm telling you this because I was uh, reading a 
I am having oasis of stillness being translated into Hindi. <clears throat> and there was a story of the shoe thief. Some of you may have read that book, The Story of Shoe Thief. In early days when Baba was uh, a young man and people would gather around him, one day somebody's shoe was stolen. Second day, two pairs of shoes were stolen. Third day, three or four pairs of shoes were stolen. The word got around that somebody is stealing shoes. The fourth day, one pair of shoe was stolen, but that shoe belonged to a jeweler of the town who caused a ruckus in the crowd. Oh, my shoes were so expensive, and who stole it? One guy, one disciple of Baba had kept his eyes open, and he knew who had taken those shoes. He caught him. Brought him to Baba. Baba asked the shoe thief, why do you steal shoes? He said, Baba, I don't know what else to do and I have to raise my family and this is the only thing I do. So Baba said, can you do something, other thing? He said, I just don't know what to do. Baba said, how about making some, selling some tea or uh, peanuts or something on the street? You could make a little money. He said, but I have no money. So Baba called the businessman whose shoes were stolen. He said, tell me, you are a jeweler. People give you gold and silver, and sometimes you take a little bit from them before you make their jewelry. He said, yeah, Baba, once in a while. Baba said, that's not stealing. And somebody has just stolen your shoe, and you are causing such a ruckus. Can you give him 50 rupees? To the shoe thief. <laughs> that guy was very upset that here he has stolen my shoes and now Baba wants me to give him 50 rupees. Anyway, he did give him 50 rupees. With that money, the shoe thief went and bought some peanuts and roasted them and started selling them. And a couple of weeks later, he had given up being a shoe thief and he had, his business life had started. Our heart has, should have compassion just because something we see and we hear and we make up our mind and now that is my truth and I want to fix it. We can fix it with a compassion in our heart, not with judgment. Otherwise, how, how are we different than anybody else? Anybody can judge a person who has little weakness or mindlessness. Sometimes people say when they're mindless something and then we take it to be their truth. Now we have to fight for it. So these kind of things are also part of our spiritual life. What is my experience? And whatever I'm hearing is that's the absolute truth. Sometimes we hear things, see, even see things. Why that person, somebody is doing something. Maybe they're doing it in a strange state of mind they are. If I go to the same level, then what's the difference between them and me? Can I expand my heart? Can I practice the power of compassion, power of love, power of acceptance? Those things are much greater than the power of judgment. Spirituality is <clears throat> not only sitting on the cushion and meditating with our beads. Spirituality is practicing the things that we, that resonate in our heart. 
that makes our heart big. And if we don't practice, who is going to practice? This is our dharma, being a spiritual person. If I call myself a spiritual practitioner, we have to pay attention to what we say to who and what kind of impact it's going to have on the other person. And if it comes to us, then we also have to think what I'm hearing, what I'm listening. Sometimes people say things that they don't mean. They don't mean that way. It comes out towards someone because of their behavior. And then they take it and they pass it on to somebody else and then that becomes their truth and they are running with a judgment. So we have to pay attention to these things that how I conduct myself. Am I living in fear? Can I be, can I bring that spirituality in my life and bring a little compassion, understand someone who is in a uncomfortable spot in their life. The story of shoot thief. Baba has told us so many little stories like this. That's we can bring in our life. <clears throat> look at ourselves. Anyway, it's uh, 10 30 at night here, 11 o'clock, and usually it's past my bedtime, so that's why we turned it an hour earlier. And it's a long day here, all day long. I have a stream of people coming, visiting, and this and that, so it's good to see you. Since I have decided to stay here till February, I will keep sharing with you my little journey and experiences in Varanasi and weave that in our daily life, how we live. And let me please tell you, we think we have problems in the, in the States. No, we have problems here. We create our own problems. If we don't have any problem, we find it and make things a problem. Always stay in the remembrance of all the blessings in our life, all the things we have in the West. Driving down here to the ashram the other day, where we serve a meal every Saturday to these families. They're living in a round sewer pipe. Just because it's a six foot long round thing and family of four or five are in there covered by a tarp. They have no food or they have whatever they have. But they're so happy to receive the little porridge, little khichdi cooked rice and dal and the spark in those eyes, the happiness in those eyes is contagious. We also have started this year new project. All the girls at Shantiniketan, there are 25 of them, career counseling, vocational counseling, so those girls could start thinking where they're going in life and how they can start preparing for, for those things from the very beginning. That's a nice project to see those girls and talk to them. What do they want to be in life? And their smiles and their aspirations are beautiful to watch. 
And it's all happening because of our ashram and our sangha that you are there. And all the boys here, we're talking to them also, their aspiration. It's very different now from early days when they used to be five, six years old. Now they're 15, 16, 19, 18. And one kid, Bharat, he just won a gold medal in karate. And he was so proud. He walked, he came to us when he was three years old. Now he's 19 and clutching his gold medal medallion, he came in and gave it to me. And it was just so sweet to watch that. So things like that are very moving. We are making a difference in the lives of those who had no place to go at one time. All day long, I talk to people. They come with all kinds of problems. And those problems have sometimes very simple solutions. They just need to hear from somebody they respect. Anyway, I would love to hear what's on your mind if you have any questions. And I will stop right here. Thank you for listening.